Welcome back to Movie Rewind. Today I will recap for you a crime, horror, mystery film from 2021 titled Spiral. Spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. An off-duty detective, Marv, joins the crowd of people gathered downtown to celebrate Independence Day. Dressed in his summer linen suit, Marv strolls down Main Street enjoying the fireworks when he observes an Uncle Sam snatch a woman's purse right off her shoulder. Despite enjoying a rare night off, Marv identifies himself as a police officer and takes off after the thief. With Marv hot on his trail, the Uncle Sam descends a nearby manhole, and Marv begrudgingly follows him down. Marv tracks the suspect to the end of the tunnel, where Uncle Sam is seated but refuses to obey voice commands. Marv carefully approaches the subject, gun drawn, but discovers the torso was only a mannequin before Marv is subdued by a figure wearing a pig mask. Soon after, Marv regains consciousness and finds himself in an active subway tunnel. His wrists are bound with barbed wire and a metal clamp tightly secured around his tongue. The television in front of Marv suddenly turns on, displaying a recorded message from the pig mask figure. The number 3 train arrives in exactly 2 minutes, but it is up to Marv to determine whether he lives or dies. Marv has taken the witness stand countless times, using his lying tongue to railroad innocent suspects, but today, Marv is the one who will be railroaded. To survive, Marv must take a leap of faith and step off the narrow piece of wood barely supporting his body weight. His tongue will be lost in the process, but the alternative is to stay put and be killed by the oncoming train. The recording ends and Marv slips his wrists free from the barbed wire, but finds no way to release the contraption gripping his tongue. As the oncoming train lights grow brighter, Marv desperately tries to pull himself free, but he remains hesitant to step off the support. At the very last moment, Marv kicks the step away, but it is way too late for that and he is killed by the impact of the train. The following day, Detective Zeke Banks is receiving a stern reprimand from his captain, Angie, who is fed up after Zeke's latest endeavor. An outcast amongst his peers, Zeke again acted alone in a rogue operation, infiltrating a group of violent criminals who then robbed a rival drug dealer of both drugs and money. Unaware that he was working undercover, Zeke's colleagues were shocked when they went to apprehend the perpetrator only to find Zeke behind the wheel of the getaway vehicle. Moreover, as a homicide detective, Zeke should have referred the case to the narcotics unit. Tired of Zeke's lone wolf attitude, Angie assigns him to partner with detective in training, William Shank. Zeke protests to the assignment, adamant that he's unable to trust anyone else in their station, but Angie doesn't waver and the assignment is set. Young and full of optimism, William notes that he was inspired to join the force by Zeke's father, the now-retired police chief Marcus Banks. William is excited to be partnered with Zeke, even if the feeling isn't mutual, and he tries to establish a working relationship by sharing a photo of his wife and son, Charlie. The pair are assigned to investigate the subway tunnel murder, whose victim was reported to be a deceased vagrant. The gory scene causes the young detective to recoil, but Zeke barely notices and determines that the victim was not homeless after seeing his Apple Watch and gold wedding ring. After collecting the necessary evidence and returning to the station, a package addressed to Zeke is delivered to him there. The box is carefully opened to reveal a flash drive bearing the message Play Me, which Zeke does but only after swapping to William's computer in case it contains a virus. The drive, which could only have come from the killer, contains a video bearing several clues, the trademark spiral design used by the Jigsaw Killer, who was killed years ago, and the background wall which Zeke immediately recognizes as the downtown courthouse. Finding the location from the video leads the police to a gift box containing what appears to be part of a human tongue, and police badge number 453, which also corresponds to Detective Mar Bozik. A station-wide meeting is called and Angie assigns the case to another detective, but Zeke pleads with her to reconsider as he and Marv were very close, his only friend on the entire force. After some hesitation, Angie relents, on the condition that Zeke works cooperatively with the rest of the department. His colleagues, however, are less than thrilled to have Zeke leading the investigation and aren't shy about expressing their displeasure. Twelve years ago, while his father Marcus was still acting chief of police, Zeke turned in a corrupt cop for homicide and a wrongful shooting. The act earned Zeke a Medal of Honor, but lost him the trust of his fellow officers, and he has found himself ostracized ever since. Additionally, Marcus was furious that Zeke didn't allow the situation to be handled internally, and their relationship has never fully recovered. Detective Fitch Another homicide detective, follows a lead from one of the Independence Day street cameras and recognizes a junkie that may have been following Marv the night he was murdered. Due to his distaste for Zeke's leadership, Fitch breaks protocol and opts to track down the subject on his own, which leads him to an abandoned bread factory in a bad area of town. There, 
Fitch finds what he believes to be the subject, sleeping on a dirty mattress with his head covered by a blanket. The figure, however, is revealed to be a rubber pig mask, and Fitch is ambushed from behind by the true killer. After being rendered unconscious, Fitch abruptly wakes in a tub full of water, his fingers trapped in mesh and attached to single steel cables. The video left for him reveals that Fitch has just 90 seconds until the water touches the copper wire, which contains enough voltage to administer a lethal electrical shock. In order to save himself, Fitch must start the motor crank by biting down on the mouthpiece, which will remove the very fingers that Fitch used to kill an unarmed civilian during a routine traffic stop. Realizing there is no alternative, Fitch starts the motor and immediately begins writhing in pain, as his fingers are slowly but steadily pulled from his hands. The sacrifice proves to be for naught when the crank is briefly paused, causing the water level to rise and electrocute Fitch anyways. Another clue is delivered to the police station for Zeke, which leads him to a box containing Fitch's detective badge and severed fingers. Moreover, the latest murder leads some officers to direct their suspicions towards Zeke. Several years prior, Zeke had called for backup while pursuing a violent fugitive. Fitch heard the call and ignored it, despite being the officer closest to the scene, which resulted in Zeke being shot in the stomach, and Chief Banks subsequently punching Fitch in the face after hearing what happened. Considering that the killings may actually be personal in nature, Zeke goes to see his former partner Pete, who now leads an Alcoholics Anonymous group after spending nine long years in prison. Zeke recalls the details of the case for William. After learning of a civilian planning to testify against another officer, Pete got the address and visited the witness at home. After confirming the man did in fact have incriminating evidence, Pete shot the witness dead and planted a gun on him in order to protect the other officer. Zeke arrived shortly after and raised questions about the shooting, which led to Pete being tried and convicted in court. Nevertheless, Pete has a rock-solid alibi for the night in question, so Zeke and William move on and consider it a dead lead. The following day, William is uncharacteristically late for work and fails to answer his phone when Zeke calls. Soon after, another suspicious package arrives via courier, this one much larger in size. The station is cleared as a precautionary measure, but no explosives are found inside. Instead, the box contains a small pig doll wrapped with a patch of William's tattooed skin. Also found underneath is a small jar of craft paint, bearing the logo of a train shop Zeke used to visit as a child. The team travels to the store, which has since been converted to a butcher shop, where they find a body hanging in the meat locker. The victim's skin appears to have been removed post-mortem, and a tape recorder contains the message played for William. It's not long before the pig mask suspect strikes again, this time attacking an on-duty officer with a combat knife. The officer manages to escape with relatively minor wounds, sustaining several lacerations to his right forearm. As Zeke interviews the attacked officer on scene, Angie receives a lead from Marcus directing her to an archived case file. Upon entering the evidence room, Angie encounters one of the trademark pig masks and the vault door closes and locks behind her. Any attempts to shoot her way out prove to be futile, and she can't call for help due to the phone lines being disabled. The room begins filling with gas and Angie is eventually rendered unconscious. Upon waking, she finds herself secured to a metal table, her face covered by a mesh screen and positioned beneath a vat of boiling hot wax. The nearby tape recording reveals that as punishment for consistently covering up her subordinates' misdeeds, Angie's face will be covered by the dripping hot wax until she inevitably suffocates. To stop the flow of wax, she must sever her spinal cord using the blade resting beneath her. As the flow rate steadily increases, Zeke, who determined that the slashing attack was merely a diversion, rushes into the station to look for Angie. She manages to halt the stream of wax, but Angie's injuries and oxygen restriction combine to kill her, and Zeke breaks into the evidence room only to find her body. The review of the surveillance camera reveals 13 minutes of missing footage, and although the system cannot identify who deleted the files, it lists the officers who recently logged into the server which includes Zeke's former partner Pete. With so many loose ends leading back to Zeke, his colleague demands he hand off the case, but as usual, Zeke doesn't care what he thinks. Instead, Zeke returns to the church which houses Pete's support group, but he finds it empty and gets abducted on his way out the door. Some hours later, Zeke's father Marcus follows a lead to an abandoned warehouse, but discovers that the visit was expected based on the note painted for him on the wall. After finding a collection of pig masks and the marionette used in the suspect's videos, Marcus turns around where the suspect has appeared to subdue and abduct him. In a scenario reminiscent of the very first jigsaw case, Zeke wakes up handcuffed to a pipe, with a hacksaw within arm's reach. An unidentified man is chained up nearby, but his face is covered and he's unresponsive when called out too. Zeke tries unsuccessfully to saw off the handcuffs and briefly considers using the hacksaw on his arm, 
but he retrieves a nearby bobby pin which he uses to pick the lock and break free. Removing the shroud from his fellow captor reveals the chained up man to be Pete. In the same way that Zeke's career was shattered after exposing Pete, the room contains a large glass crushing machine, rigged to hurl shards of broken glass at high speeds. Zeke is offered two choices, open the lock and free Pete, or do nothing and allow justice to be served. As the glass begins flying, a clue from the recording leads to a key in the trash can, and Zeke braves the stream of flying glass to open the lock and free Pete. With shards of glass hanging from his face, Zeke removes Pete from the chains but he has already died. The door is then opened releasing Zeke from the room, and he navigates the empty warehouse until he finds William awaiting his arrival. Only then is William able to tell his story. Fifteen years ago, William hid in the closet and watched Pete shoot and kill his father. The tattoo of Charlie, which he bore on his arm, was not the name of the son he doesn't have, it belonged to his father. The skinned body found hanging the butcher shop was actually the bum who led Marv down into the subway tunnel, and the lead that lured Marcus to the abandoned warehouse was sent from Zeke's phone, after William asked to borrow it. As a final offer, William asks Zeke to team up with him. After turning in his partner for murder, Zeke received nothing but mistreatment from his fellow officers, amidst a sea of corruption throughout the department. Like John Kramer, William sees the spiral as a symbol of change and social progress. Thinking solely about his father's safety, Zeke agrees to William's offer so long as his dad is unharmed. As a test of Zeke's resolve, William summons the police force by logging a 911 call. He hands Zeke the gun and leads him down the warehouse hallway, where the door is slid open to reveal Zeke's father. Marcus is found hanging several feet off the ground, suspended in mid-air by steel cables attached to the ceiling. With the SWAT team already arriving, William presents Zeke with a final decision. The revolver he's holding contains just one final bullet, which can free his father before he slowly bleeds out by shooting the spiral target overhead. Alternatively, he can opt to shoot William with a single bullet, but his father will die before medical arrives. As the SWAT team closes in on their location, Zeke contemplates his options in the face of a new revelation. In Zeke's early days as an officer, much of the police-involved violence was attributed to Article 8. One of the most corrupt law enforcement policies ever adopted, it turned police officers into vigilantes, all under the leadership of Marcus and his second in charge, Angie. Zeke turns and shoots the spiral target, dropping his father to the ground and allowing William to board the elevator. Hearing the gunshot, the tactical team begins sawing through the metal door, and Zeke chases down William and tackles him. A fist fight ensues with Zeke clearly gaining the advantage, but William planned for one last contingency. When the door is finally breached, one of the steel cables is rigged to raise Marcus's arm, where a gun had been planted. Zeke can only scream in agony as he watches the SWAT team gun down his father, then turns to see William descending down the elevator. Okay guys, thank you for watching. Please leave a like on the video, and subscribe to the channel to see more.